A while back on my channel I took a look at Spellbound's tactical RTS games, that is Desperados, Robin Hood and Chicago 1930. But these games weren't actually the first of that type of game that I played. Allow me to introduce you to the series that was the granddad of Spellbound's creations. Hi, my name is Chris and today we'll take an in-depth look at the Commandos series. The games comprising the Commander series are arguably the first tactical RTS games that found their way to a broader audience. And as you can see, it inspired a group of other people to take a shot at the genre, adding their own unique spin. Oh, and seeing as the story is not that relevant this time around, there will be minimal spoilers, by the very nature of these games. But still, if you want to go into it completely blind, then here is your spoiler warning, as I will probably talk in more detail about a couple of missions, especially when it comes to the mission pack for the first Commandos game. At the same time, I would like you to like, comment, subscribe and what's most important, share this video, if you find it interesting that is. It would help me a lot if you did that. So let's get into the games, but first a few basics that pertain to all parts of the series or rather to all tactical RTS games. And yes, it will be to some extent a retread of the things I talked about in the Spellbound video, but it is highly likely that you haven't seen that one, so a bit of introduction to these games is in order. The basic gist of it is that you have a group of specialists, and in the case of Commandos, this group is comprised out of soldiers. Fighting in the theaters of World War II against the Germans in Europe and later the Japanese on the Pacific performing tasks that are impossible for a whole army to achieve, tasks that require a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer, like infiltration and destruction of key installations, retrieving POWs or kidnapping important enemy personnel, in short, performing missions deep behind enemy lines. The gameplay itself is somewhat akin to playing Jenga. You have to remove each soldier so that no other notices it, at least that is the most common approach with the one difference that Jenga gets more difficult the further along it gets. In Commandos the difficulty goes down with each eliminated enemy, seeing as your team has more room to maneuver. Each soldier under your command is a master in his, or later even her field, outfitted with unique equipment and capable of performing very concrete tasks. And other than in the later Spellbound or Minimi games, the quantity of the special abilities available to each soldier is varied with some having a couple of options and other only perhaps two or even one. Be it as it may, the crux of the issue is utilizing these abilities to the fullest, to clear the map of enemies on the way to your objective. And seeing as the fact who you will be commanding is arguably the most important part of these games, let's take a look at each soldier separately. There are the core six from the first game, then in the expansion one agent is added and in the second game a thief makes his debut. So let's take a look at each of the six that are present in the first game. I will talk about the rest as soon as we hit each game in the series, so don't worry, their introduction will come in due time. Plus it is then that I will talk about the new abilities for all of them. The most important and by far the most versatile of your soldiers is definitely the Green Beret. He is also the one that is present in almost all missions. He has a handgun, which is a given as it is the only tool that is available to every member of the team. It takes 3 shots from the pistol to kill any enemy. There are also guns that kill with one shot, but they come later. So the handgun is there so that every commando has means to defend himself if push comes to shove. But as I see it, if you have to use the pistol, then something already went horribly wrong, in most cases. Unless you prefer the guns blazing approach, which is also many times a valid one. But back to the beret. He is also one of the two commandos that can carry bodies. The other one is the spy, which comes in handy as he can also kill enemies with his trusty knife. And to be completely honest, his knife had the highest kill count when it comes to my playstyle in the first game, as most of the time it was easiest to knife someone with the beret and then quickly carry him away using the same soldier. He can also climb over some few chosen obstacles and has a very, very, very handy radio transmitter on him. It's phenomenal at distracting enemies, it made my life easier more than once. And lastly, he carries a small shovel that allows him to bury himself into snow or sand to avoid being spotted by the enemies, or for the purposes of executing an ambush. 
although I always got only limited use out of this, as the terrain that the berry can dig in was also the one that he left his footprints in. So most of the time, even if I did manage to hide him in time, the footprints would betray him anyway. Mind you, I'm not saying that this ability is useless, it's just that I personally didn't found much use for it. But seeing online what people can do with that ability, I'm convinced now that this is only a me problem. Maybe I had the wrong approach, who knows. Also, a word to that footprint stuff. Each of your men will leave them behind. They do disappear after a short while. But yes, enemies will discover them on snow or sand and can start looking for whoever left them, if it wasn't one of their compatriots. So I always had to be mindful of that as it screwed up my meticulously planned tactics more than once. Next up is the sniper. As the name indicates, he's the expert marksman of the team, which is honestly about all he can do. Plus in some missions he will have the medkit to heal someone if the need arises. He may not have the most versatile skill set or equipment, but his rifle is deadly effective, as it kills every enemy soldier with just one hit and for all intents and purposes, has virtually unlimited range. You most likely be far more often blocked by something in the way, rather than the sniper not having enough reach. And above all else, his weapon is deadly silent, meaning no alarm and no unnecessary hassle. And as you might have guessed by now, such a powerful weapon has to have some drawbacks. And it has, in the form of a limited ammo supply. Honestly, if the sniper took with him on missions a couple more magazines or bullets, each of them would be a cakewalk. I like the sniper, but out of all the other soldiers, he is the one that has the least to do during missions. Well, he and the driver. Okay, let me retract that. He is the second to last. When I think about it, it was the driver that for the most time was sitting idly by when the others did the dirty work. Ah, no matter, let's get on to the next one. Now we will get to my absolute favorite, the Marine. It is quite a special one, as his range of skills and equipment is quite impressive. But before I'll get to that, one note on his sprite in game. He seems to have a rather large hitbox compared to everyone else, and you might think, what difference does it make, if most enemy weapons never miss, with the exception of machine guns of various calibers. Well, imagine that you run away from enemies and place the marine rather absent-mindedly near train tracks. Not on the tracks, mind you, but dangerously close. And when the train comes, it hits the marine's backpack, so he dies. This exact scenario happened to me more than once. The few pixels comprising his backpack were hit on the tracks, and that's all it took. Sure, this is rather realistic, but frustrated me to no end. And seeing as each commando has his own movement speed, the marine was by far the most finicky to maneuver. Don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining, just thought i point out that the marine's backpack makes him more lumbering and a bigger target at times. As to why he has such a big backpack, well, he has to store in it a whole inflatable boat, which he carries around with him at all time. Well, maybe sometimes it is placed somewhere on the map and he has to first get to it. He can also as the only one swim, using his scuba gear. Yes, in the original Commandos game and its expansion, no other than the Marine could swim. That ability will be learned by the rest once the second game comes around. But that is still ahead of us. Next, he has a knife, just like the Beret. And at last, the most useful, at least for me, part of his equipment, the harpoon. It kills enemies with one hit, just like the knife, but in addition to that, it has reach. Yeah, it's arguably not that high. To be frank, it's very short. But in a game like Commandos, the ability to dispatch enemies without making any noise, even over a small distance, is a godsend in many cases. I can't even count the number of times that this piece of equipment saved me at the last minute without raising the alarm, which is mightily important. I will get to that stuff about alarms in a bit. Just imagine, you swim as close as you can to an enemy, then pop out of the water for a short second, kill him with the harpoon and dive again. It's tons of fun. Well, each commando has his moments, but this is especially entertaining. Now we need a demolition expert, and for that we have the sapper, proficient in a various assortment of explosives, counting those remotely controlled with the timer as well as grenades. 
He also has access to the often overlooked tool, the bear trap. It is also a one-hit wonder like the harpoon, with the one difference being that it is, well, a trap. It has to be placed on the enemy's patrol route to do the deed. It works wonders coupled with the Green Beret's remote-controlled radio. Simply a match made in heaven. Oh, and he also has wire cutters on him, which are really handy in any mission with a fence, as he can create many new access points to the enemy base. The fifth commando is the driver. He, like the sniper, has access to the medkit, but also can use an automatic rifle as well as the heavier guns previously manned by the Germans. Those, of course, have to be liberated prior to that use. And to be completely honest, I never used either the SMG or the gun in the nest. It isn't even the fact that these weapons aren't powerful, because in the right circumstances, they are. But rather, it's that their mode of firing is frustrating as hell to me. You see, each automatic rifle shoots in a slightly arced way in the area where you click, which is all well and good. It can even stunlock the enemy for a brief second, but hitting anyone with that burst was a personal nightmare for me. I always ended up shooting slightly behind or in front of an enemy. To put it simply, most of my shots were misses, and if the enemy soldiers were running towards my position, I simply knew that I had no chance, even with a heavy gun. Although that changed as soon as the driver executed the last of his unique abilities, namely driving a tank, or any other vehicle for that matter, as he is the only commando capable of doing so. And seeing as the tank has access to weapons and is impervious to small arms fire, the enemy stood still firing on my tank, which was for all intents and purposes indestructible to them. Long enough for me to machine gun them to death. When the Germans weren't moving, it proved to be deadly effective. Believe me, the moment you get access to an armored vehicle, it's basically game over for the other side. The only thing that can stop you then is an anti-tank gun, another tank or most often the terrain. One of the first missions, one with train tracks and a villa, is exactly so. The first half is easily cleared by the means of tank, but the bridge prevents any further use of that vehicle, so the rest has to be done on foot. But when I played, more often than not, the driver sat idly by, while his friends did the cleanup. And seeing as most vehicles with weaponry that he could drive were somewhere deep in the enemy base, it was easy to omit that entirely, seeing as most of the level was cleared anyway. And lastly on the roster is the spy, a welcome sight in any mission. An invaluable help, especially if fitted with the right clothes, which more often than not are somewhere on the map hanging on the line. Which is actually a bizarre concept to me. An officer's clothes hanging on the line in some base. Oh well, maybe it was actually how it was done. Thanks to that disguise, the spy can wander around the whole map without being bothered and can even distract enemies, which makes the life of the rest of your squad much easier. In his possession is also another quite unique thing, a syringe with poison. While it is one of a kind, how it functions is rather simple. It's basically a knife in liquid form, the same effect and the same range, at least for now. The other thing is that the spy is the second commando who can lift and move bodies, other than the Green Beret that is. Now let's get to the first commando's game, Behind Enemy Lines, a set of 20 missions with varying levels of difficulty. Let's jump right into it. The men I just described are available to you in the first game, just not at the same time. Other than that, there are from time to time some additional characters, like the pilot, but they serve mostly as unarmed VIPs. For all intents and purposes, they are, well, basically dead weight that needs to be hauled around or rescued. So even though you have six commandos, you will order around a select few on any given mission. The one exception is the last one, where you will have access to the whole team. I think that the devs wanted to underscore the difficulty and importance of that mission in a way. It takes place in a castle and its immediate surroundings. During that assignment, you are tasked with the destruction of some surface-to-surface -surface missiles. This map is quite fun and even today the art style really holds up. That is, if you don't zoom in too much. If you do, there will be a lot of pixel action going on. But there is something rather strange when it comes to the maps themselves. Even though most of them have that showstopper, that big centerpiece, that one big thing that draws your attention. A unforgettable dam, a lift high in the mountains, a grand villa, submarines or even a battleship, to name a few. 
they still lack something and feel very barren most of the time. The buildings are sometimes awkwardly spaced and there is very little clutter that takes up the scene. Some few things that suggest that people live there, even if most of the maps are military installations. The level design could be a bit better. Sure, there is some stuff placed on the map, but rather sparingly. The type of stuff that one would consider fluff or unimportant, but that would give a bit of depth to the scenery, apart from the obvious utilitarian things like barracks, defense installations or trees. Still, it will become better in due time. But so you understand me correctly, I don't mean that the maps are bad. By no means am I saying that. They feel rather simple and unrefined, yet. As this game came out quite some time ago and the team was still gathering experience, this is more than understandable. And believe me, they did learn well. So I know it sounds strange, but the missions when played in the European theater tend to blur together in my mind, to a point that I found myself wondering what mission had what objectives and outstanding features. Don't get me wrong, there are a few mobs that escape this problem. One where you pilot a submarine or another that takes place on the roofs of a city chiefly come to mind. But as I said, the rest is rather lackluster, lacking something that would give them a bit more character and thus made them more memorable. When it comes to me, the most important thing that I remember about most of them is whether they were green, white or yellow. Although that yellow part is not entirely true. You see, after the 8th mission or so, there is a change in scenery. The commandos will be sent to Africa to try and throw some wrenches in the German war machine. And seeing as there are a total of 20 missions, such change of scenery is a welcome one. Thanks to that the maps are a bit more distinct as I am fairly certain that most players vividly remember the operations in the desert. These few missions made a whole world of difference when it comes to my enjoyment of the game. Without that added visual variety, I feel that all the missions would just blur into one big blob of washed out variation on green or white, where you would be hard pressed to tell in which mission you had what objectives. What is strange is that it would seem that the assignments in Africa had a bit more detailed maps than the rest of them. Or maybe it's just an impression due to the fact that there are comparatively fewer of them, so they stand out in my mind that much more. Although such a drastic change in scenery is not required to add visual variety and more character to the levels. But I will talk about that when we come to the expansion for the first game. The funny thing is that whether I was in the desert or not, I started most levels in much the same way. Unless there was something on the map that started escaping due to noise and could give me the slip. You see, I grouped all my commandos in a corner or at least behind a wall ordered them to take out their pistols and started shooting. True, an alarm would have been sounded, but that is exactly what I was hoping for. Every German that could hear the shots being fired would come running around the corner, where my commandos were ready to mow them down. At least, three pistols would mean that one click of the mouse equals one less soldier to worry about. And as the alarm also means that each and every garrison on the map spits out new patrols, they would also fall into my trap. I repeated that procedure as long as there were enemies in the garrison buildings. After I cleared them, most of the time the maps became a lot easier to deal with. Although it wasn't always that easy, as the Germans can get in a couple lucky shots that can decimate your team if you're not careful. Not to mention that some missions require absolute stealth. For these missions a slow and methodical approach to dispatch enemies is advised. As far as the mission objectives are concerned, they are for the most part rather simple. Blow some stuff up and escape, likely with a stolen vehicle. But there are also other types of objectives, like keeping sappers from blowing a bridge or rescuing a captive pilot. But mostly it is infiltrate the enemy base and blow shit up, which is fun in its own right, so no complaints from me there. Commandos behind enemy lines is a large proof of concept, at least for me. A proof of concept that takes place over 20 missions, it's still highly playable, with a bit dull maps at times and some rather silly puffing issues. But the idea was sound and with a bit more polish this gem would shine. And it did shine in the next installment in the series, Beyond the Call of Duty. An official expansion pack for the first game, as it was released way back, it doesn't even need the base game to function. Basically it's a few new missions, new abilities and equipment. 
and a new addition to the team, even if only for one assignment. The one funny thing is that I still remember to this day a review that I read in one of the PC gaming magazines. Too much for an expansion, too little for a standalone game. But it was an expansion, so it should be judged as such. This expansion pack is a great addition to the Commander series. It had and still has its vehement opponents, mostly on the count of its difficulty. But I for one adore these 8 missions that were given to us this time. Each of them is superb and as I tend to play this expansion only on hard, that difficulty isn't something that I'm particularly worried about. Although I freely admit, it takes a lot of trial and error to get all things right. But seeing us saving and loading is very fast, that isn't a problem. But to even the odds of impossibly overlapping enemy patrol routes, the devs gave us new toys to experiment and fool around with. All of them are not only interesting, but also add a level of depth to the game's tactics that wasn't present before. To be completely honest, this is the first time in the series that I felt actual tactical freedom in approaching a problem. Sure, it was possible in the first game too, but this time all the commandos are more useful than the obvious Green Beret, Spy or Marine. So, let's take a look at what new tools are at our disposal. Firstly, there are the ones that are accessible by each commando. It is worth adding that the Sniper, Marine and Sapper did not get any new abilities that are specific to them. Oh, and there is a new team member. A Dutch agent of Ukrainian descent, if I remember correctly. But she is only available in the last mission and functions pretty much like the spy. Just without the added benefit of the spy's tools, like the chloroform or poison. In short, she can move around fairly freely without being recognized and can distract enemies. And that's about it. I never put that much stock in her, as she really is just a side note in the expansion pack. A fun one, that much is true, but severely underutilized. But I have to admit that she fits perfectly in the mission she's in. That small Dutch town just needed a woman in it. But let's get back to the new abilities. The most important one is the fact that the Green Beret, Driver and Spy can now knock out enemy soldiers via the use of the fist, club or chloroform respectively. And then they can be handcuffed. And that little novelty adds a whole lot of new tactics and makes the gameplay more varied. And that's because there are two important things that you can do with a handcuffed enemy. The first one is the fact that the spy can now take the uniform of an apprehended soldier and wear it himself. That means that he can disguise himself as anyone, from a common soldier through a lieutenant and ending on a general, which was the default disguise in the first game. And one little side note here, that probably is specific to me. I'm really very fond of the graphics used for each uniform in the expansion, as these are now way more detailed to a point that I try to take the clothes of each different enemy type just to see how it looks, as it now resembles actual uniforms rather than a dirty black tire as in behind enemy lines. Actually, all the graphics used on the backpacks are wonderful. This is something I didn't talk about in the first game, but the UI when it comes to the commandos abilities is simply fantastic. Each ability is represented in the form of a handy icon displayed on a backpack in the bottom right corner of the screen. It may seem trivial, but it feels very aesthetically pleasing. And the expansion took it up a notch with the addition of the new abilities and the overall resolution of these little drawings. The fun part is that these abilities are not just a list or square icons, but that it gives a bit more visual candy to look at. And when I played these games for the first time, it really gave me the impression that my men were rummaging in their backpacks to find the necessary tool. Well, I know they weren't, but it made it feel so. It did wonders for how these games pulled me in. But back to the spy. There are four distinct sets of clothes that the spies can wear. The ones I already mentioned and one that some people can easily miss. The uniform of the zoo employee from the second mission, which for all intents and purposes functions like the general's uniform. While wearing it you can wander anywhere you want, no questions asked. And the fact that nobody will bother you is not so clear in this game. Because, you see, each uniform grants you protection only from the level of the enemy that the uniform belongs to and below. So, for example, the common soldier disguise will be instantly seen through by a lieutenant or general, and the lieutenant uniform can be seen through by a general. That's the basic gist of it. 
which means in practice that if you get the lieutenant's uniform, you will be virtually safe the whole level through, as there is a very low amount of generals roaming around. One to be exact if my memory serves me right. It's an awesome new mechanic that makes the spy that more important and powerful, as you can use his abilities right from the get-go and not only when you get to a close line. But the other and arguably far more important use of a handcuffed enemy is the fact that you can make them obey your orders by holding them at gunpoint. Each commando can control one German soldier and order them to distract other enemies. The one thing that you have to look out for is the blue area displayed on the ground which shows how far a coerced soldier can go. If he, by some chance, gets out of that area, he will immediately break free and sound an alarm, which actually happened to me rather often, especially in the first mission, as there is a lot of elevated levels and stairs, which tends to cut off that control area rather drastically in the matter of seconds, when my commando moved or was pushed for some reason. But that doesn't make this tool any less useful. It is tremendously handy through the entire game, and made my life easier more than once. Plus it opens a whole new world of possibilities and tactics available to the player. You can now use a lieutenant to stop a patrol group and a basic soldier to distract sentries. The interesting part is that you have still total control over your commando, which means that you can knife or shoot someone or use any other tool at your disposal. As long, of course, as you maintain a visual on the controlled enemy. As I said, it's insanely useful. The other two new abilities are also a welcome sight. They both do pretty much the same thing, only in different ways. Now each commando, not only the Green Berry, has the ability to distract enemies by throwing a stone or a pack of cigarettes. In the first case, the enemy will at minimum turn his head to where the stone came from or where it landed. And at maximum, after three throws, he will run to the place from where the stones came from. In the second case, the enemy will go and pick up the pack of cigarettes laying on the ground, also exposing himself to a surprise attack, although if an enemy already has a pack with him, he will stay put. Finally, there was a way to lure enemies away by using items that are readily available, not just the one radio that the Green Berry has. Oh, I almost forgot. The driver has now a rifle, which is great. It has phenomenal range, but poor rate of fire, although if you decide to go in guns blazing, there is no better weapon than this. It's no sniper rifle, that much is true, as it makes a bit of noise, but the reach is fantastic. And it also kills with one hit, so I ended up using it quite a lot. Looking at these abilities could lead you to think that the game is now way too easy. I mean, adding such powerful skills surely would make each mission a cakewalk. Well. Maybe, but in a different game than Commanders, especially on the high difficulty. This game can and will punish each screw up in an instant, which is actually fine with me. I love a challenge in a tactical RTS, but sometimes the enemies have such ridiculously overlapping patrol routes or cones of sight that each action has to be executed like clockwork to make it work, and it can be frustrating at times. Even only remembering the landing on the island from the first mission or getting behind the walls where the mansion and the colonel are in the sixth gives me a weary headache. But still, I for one welcome that difficulty, because with only 8 missions it's a great way to expand my playtime with this excellent game. And speaking of excellent, let's talk about the maps for a bit. The style is exactly the same as in the first game, but much improved over the predecessor. They are more distinct now. First of all, they don't feel as empty as previous. There are way more buildings, trees or other stuff that serves no other purpose other than just give a bit more character to the locales. A trimmed hedge here and there, some more tracks and trains, a pile of firewood or some old ruins to name a few. All these make the maps very pleasant to look at, not to mention more fun to play. There are also animals now in two of the eight missions, I think. There are some chicken in the one with the planes and, of course, lions and ostriches in the zoo. But above all else, there is way more color now. Even though the missions take place in Europe, it isn't the same cold color palette of the first game. You can instantly tell if something takes place in Greece or in the Netherlands. And I for one love all of those missions, with a special spot for the sixth mission, where you have to abduct Colonel Wilhelm van Bello. And that is on the count of it being actually the demo mission for this game, that came packaged with the game magazine quite some years ago. 
And this one level was brutal. It didn't even have the special new abilities from the expansion, just the basic behind enemy lines skills. Needless to say, if you mastered the demo mission, no other assignment in the base game or this expansion would give you any trouble. And the second one that has a special place in my heart is the last one that takes place in the Netherlands. First of all, I have a soft spot for that country and secondly, the abundance of canals makes it stand out even more and gives the marine a place to shine as well as producing some unique tactical problems. Oh, and there is one little tidbit I would like to point out and ask a question at the same time to my German-speaking viewers. In the seventh mission, where the Green Beret and the driver are being held in a POW camp and await rescue, there is a fence that can be cut by the sapper. And if any German sees that hole, he will say Eine Grube, which I find odd. Sure, German is not my native language, but as far as I know, Eine Grube is a hole, true, but one that is dug in the ground, not cut in a fence. That one should be Ein Loch, if I'm correct that is. So if any German is listening, tell me if my thinking is correct. Be it as it may. Additionally, each mission seems to have, or rather pretty definitely has, a unique quirk or two to them. Something that is specific just to that one assignment and no other. Sometimes there are a couple such things, and sometimes only one. But each of them allows any given mission to ingrain itself in the player's mind. Let's take a quick look at them. The first one takes place on a rock in the middle of the water. So the immediate thing that will come to mind is the landfall that your commandos have to make. And a rather swift one at that, because if you are not to be detected, this has to be done smoothly in a short order. Then there is the fact of the sea mines that block your path out. While one can be destroyed using a pistol, the rest has to be demolished via sniper shot. And seeing as it is a finite resource, you have to be mindful of that the entire game. Although, I for one think that this is a design oversight, seeing as the game doesn't tell you that you will need those shots, or there is perhaps another way that I didn't find out about. But if you run out of the sniper shots sooner, you will have to restart the mission, which did stink every time. And lastly, there is a small lift that will take your men right down to the beach. The second mission has arguably the most unique things on the map. Firstly, there is the firing squad that will immediately kill the man you came to rescue, if you are too loud, that is. Then there is the zookeeper that has a special uniform that the spy can wear, that allows him to move everywhere on the map, as I already stated. Then there is the part in the wall that allows you to infiltrate through the lion's den, as well as the dead elephant you can hide inside. Lastly, there is the cage with the ostriches that can be freed to cause some mayhem on the map. Or alternatively, the spy can get in, fire a few shots, wait till the Germans run in and then close the door on them. As it turns out, the enemy is weak at opening them, so they will not get out. The third and fourth mission are the most straightforward ones. One just has the objective of the mission that has to be picked up and carried away, and the other has a few cards on rails that can be pushed to obscure the enemy's sight, or hide bodies. And then we come to the fifth one. This has my absolutely favorite building in any Commandos game. The manor in the top right corner of the map. It's simply beautiful, and its roof has a crap ton of enemy soldiers that can spot you from a rather long distance. There is also the colonel that will drive away if you make too much noise and trigger an alarm. Also, a tank with a machine gun turret is present in this mission. It is in fact the only drivable armored vehicle in the entire expansion. Now on to 6, where you have to knock out a pilot to make him steer the plane you will escape on. But there is another, really small thing at the start of the level. A couple of chickens roaming free. They don't do anything really, but for some reason they were very notable for me. So much so that after the planes, this is the thing I most remembered about this mission. The seventh mission has your two commandos currently in a POW camp, stripped of their gear. That gear is present on the map in form of two backpacks, in the left top corner of the area behind the barn. In the camp itself, there is a prisoner that works for the Germans and will alert them if he sees something suspicious. And lastly, there is a pipe outside that the marine can dive through to reach the inner courtyard. The 8th mission sees us going to the Netherlands and they make immediate use of that, as you know by now, introducing a substantial amount of canals. Which always makes you wonder how to get rid of the guys on your side of the canal and not alert the ones on the other bank. There is a tugboat and a small drawbridge to operate. 
There are also the Gestapo agents who can see through any disguise. Which is rather important as to finish the mission, your new agent has to go inside the house to lure a general there and steal his documents. You can't even begin to imagine how many times I tried to take all the Gestapo out. Just to have the mission fail time and time again as the general became aware of my team. To then discover that the only thing I had to do was to sneak past them and get inside a building and wait a bit. It was quite frustrating when I first played it. But now as I know the trick, well, it's kind of clever. As you can see, each mission has a unique feel to it and it stands out in my mind immediately once I thought about them. One could say that this is on the count of them being only a few and a lot less than in the first game, but I for one do not agree with that. It's far more the case of a vibrant map, interesting objectives, specific mission quirks and locales, rather than the limited number of them. And in my mind the next game in the franchise is proof of that. Now a public service announcement. Please share, like, subscribe and comment. I do read all of those and am really curious about your opinion. Now let's get on with the series. You see, if you ask anyone what the best game of the series is, the most common answer will be Commandos 2. And there is a good reason for that, as this part is regarded by the broader community as the magnum opus of the Commandos series. But let's take a closer look at why that might be. Firstly, the maps, as I was just talking about them. They are now in full 3D. It's still an isometric camera, but the whole map can be rotated to your heart's content. But as far as I'm concerned, the 90 degree rotation is the most useful, as I like fixed camera angles. The expansion pack had big maps. This time around, they are not big anymore. They are simply massive. And that is in part due to the fact that there are interiors now. Each building, U-boat or statue that you can go into, you can explore to the fullest. It gave such a tremendous amount of depth to the game that the size of the maps don't even compare to the predecessors. Plus, you can peek inside the building through keyholes or windows, as well as inspect each and every container along your way. And they do contain mostly useful stuff that your men can utilize, as well as in some cases little bonuses that contain photograph pieces, but I will come to that in due time. And this major improvement or improvements did two things. The first one is that there are no garrisons, as it was the case previously, as this time you can get to each and every enemy on the map, so no amount of them will spawn out of certain buildings. And the other one is the multiplication of tactical options available to the player. Couple that with the additional abilities of your commandos and you will get something very, very special. But first thing first. There's a thief now that can open locks and is light and nimble which allows him to move very fast and perform tasks as climbing or hanging on wires for a longer time than the rest of your men. Other than that he can't tie up enemies which is rather odd but I guess it was done so that there is a bit more challenge when he is in the group because the climbing that I talked about just now applies to many of the game's walls. That means that you can climb up a house and through a window. So if he could tie up enemies, it would be a trivial matter to infiltrate through the very top and hit the enemy where he is weakest. The long and short of it is that this is a phenomenal character and fast as hell too, a well thought out addition. But let's take a look at the revamped abilities. And in this case, I won't be talking about all of them. At least I think I won't, because I'm pretty sure that I will omit some by sheer coincidence, as there are quite a few more and above all else, who can use them has drastically changed. Each one can now knock out enemies, tie them up and carry them, with the exception already stated. All of them can now use machine guns and rifles, they can even disguise themselves, but in the case of anyone other than the spy, they do it rather poorly. But still, it will delay the recognition of your men at least a little bit, and you don't need to crawl when in the second part of the view cone. As long as you don't stand around too long, the enemy soldiers will not recognize you. Also, the commandos can drive anything that is not a tank, for this you still need the driver. Additionally, they can swim and even dive now. And if you're asking how much difference does that make, let me just say that now a river, a lake or anybody of water for that matter isn't a conundrum to be solved or navigated around, but an opportunity. An opportunity to attack the enemy from a completely new and unexpected angle. You can now factor in the water-based assault in all of your tactics. There are mines, Molotov cocktails, trip wires, smoke grenades or wooden ladders and many, many more. There is even a grappling hook. 
In other words, there is a substantial amount of new abilities available to every commando and a few specific ones, like the ability of the supper to make enemies spontaneously combust using various implements, or the knife throwing ability specific to the marine, which is actually an indispensable weapon in every mission he takes part in. And seeing as each commando has his own inventory now, that means that the marine can carry and use more than one throwing knife, which makes him an unstoppable killing machine, if he has more than one. Let's take a look at the second mission, where the massive scope of possibilities available to me in approaching any given problem came to light. This one takes place in a U-boat base, with big walls and a giant U-boat bunker with subs inside. Similar as in the first mission of the expansion pack, most of your commandos have to make landfall in the base. In the later stages of this level, the Green Beret can be called in via parachute. The first time I played it, I took the obvious approach that the previous mission showed me, that is, going through the stairs near the water and infiltrating the rest of the base through there. But after a while, I got used to the new tactical options this game provides. Now I started to experiment. My favorite way by far is to swim ashore with the marine, dispatch the soldiers that are standing by the water via thrown knife, then taking their rifles and tossing their bodies into the water. Yes, you can now get rid of bodies by throwing them into the water or outside the window, for example. Then the marine used a grappling hook to get on the roof of the U-boat bunker and started the methodical elimination of enemies using this self-made entrance. Then there were some enemies on a different roof that blocked my movement. So I decided to climb up the wall with the thief and drop down a ladder so that the marine could climb up and kill everyone using his trusty knife. Were there other approaches that would work? Of course there were, a metric ton of them, each depending on the player's approach and playstyle. And that's where the fun is. Simply put, the amount of freedom I felt playing this game is unparalleled by any other Commandos game, or Commandos like for that matter. That includes both Spellbound's games as well as Mimimi games. In no other did I feel that any approach I might take will be a valid one, and if planned correctly, lead ultimately to success. You see, going into buildings through a window, climbing poles to swing on wires to the other side, diving to get somewhere from an unorthodox entrance, or even crossing a river by swimming to hit the enemy from behind, feels and is amazing. The maps, in fact, function like a big sandbox for all intents and purposes, where you can try and do anything that you can think of. The one requirement is that you study both the map and what each commando can do and get as creative with it as humanly possible. It really feels that everything can be done and is ultimately up to you. While I can tell you from memory how I approach any mission in the expansion pack, I can't do the same thing for Commandos 2. There are so many possibilities. Well, with the exception of the mission I just described, it feels somehow unimaginably awesome to use a grappling hook to infiltrate the base. There is even a fun little possibility if you play on the lowest difficulty. You see, each commando can have access to small cans of meat or spam, some small cans with food that they can consume and restore some of their HP. And seeing as on the lowest difficulty no one ever dies and can be revived, you can take the green berry with his trusty knife, knife everyone to death and chuck those cans like Popeye to get the health back. It isn't really that realistic, but fun as hell. What is even more interesting, there is no mission where you can say that the devs had a worse day and slacked off a bit. Each and every mission is big with tons of details. They even, for the first and as of now only time, send the commandos into the Pacific to fight the Japanese, which is honestly a breath of fresh air in the series, seeing as World War II took place, well, all over the world, hence the name. It felt a bit strange and stilted that most of the missions up until now took place in Europe. Sure, there were the African ones in the first game, but not much more than that. Well, now they rectified this with great success. You can't imagine how much fun it was playing on a tropical island or in an Asian city or deep in the jungle. It was a great idea to include that in the game. If they just included some missions from the African campaign, then they would have the trifecta each major conflict zone in one Commandos game. They even included a map completely covered in snow, where the U-boat from the second mission was forced to surface, so there is that. Oh, and a side note. As I see it, the beginning three missions were the first foray of the Commandos team to establish a sort of story 
between the subsequent levels, which was a welcome surprise for me, as up until now most of them were episodic in nature. And they still are after those three, although I'm not entirely sure if that's necessary for a game like Commandos to have one story arc that we follow. Maybe it could be done so that each theater of war, Europe, Africa, Asia and the Pacific, had their own campaign and told for each a different story. But I feel that a game like Commandos doesn't need a narrative structure to function, as long as there is a mission, some objectives and a sound reason for achieving them. I would even say that it fits. The role that the Commandos had were basically hit and run tactics, each time in a different place. And all of the places that we go to in this game are simply magnificent. And other than the ones I just mentioned, Castle Kolditz and Paris also need to be highlighted. Both of these maps are ridiculously big, taking into account all the buildings and rooms that one can go into. Especially the castle is very maze-like. Simply put, I love each and every mission in this game. But there are other new additions to the Commandos formula and the arguably most important one is that now you can control soldiers that are on your side but are not your commandos and execute ambushes. This is a mechanic that the game makes frequent use of. It mostly resembles a tower defense, of all things. No, the window or view doesn't change in any way, but you position these men in strategic places, lay mines and set up tripwires with nasty surprises, so that when the enemy waves come, you are ready for them. And in the best case scenario, your soldiers and the traps take them out without any input from you. It's surprisingly fun to execute such an ambush and try to outsmart the enemy by covering every possible attack vector. But there is one other thing that I must talk about, and that are the bonuses found in each mission. These are collectibles. On each map there is a set number of them placed in some containers. These bonuses are pieces of a torn photograph. In sharp contrast with other games, in Commandos 2 it isn't just a collectible for the collectible's sake, but if you manage to find each and every one of them, they will yield a bonus mission, immediately after the one you found them in. There are some that are just for fun. Well, most of them are. Like the boat racing on a truck made out of mines, which was surprisingly fun. But there is one that in some way expands the previous mission. The one where you infiltrate a Japanese aircraft carrier and try to sabotage it. Although I think that I know why they didn't do such an obvious follow-up in the case of the rest of those mini-missions. It would feel off for many people that a seemingly integral part of each level is gated behind a collectible that requires you to be very completionist about each assignment. These are very fun to play, but I think that keeping them as separated from the main missions as they did was ultimately a good idea. Even though I do think that the aircraft carrier level was the best one of the whole lot by a fairly wide margin. These bonus missions are short or even very short, but add a layer of additional fun for attentive and thorough players, expanding this game's already massive missions. In my opinion and many others, this part of the Commando series is the best one. Although I still miss the beauty of the hand-drawn maps of the expansion pack, they will always have a special place in my heart. So, how do you follow up such an amazing experience? Well, apparently you follow it up by downsizing? In Commandos 3 Destination Berlin, most of the things that they added in the previous installment are still here, but the scope of the missions is drastically smaller. It feels very boxed in by comparison. Sure, there are some bigger maps, but they are few and far between, which is baffling to me. It honestly feels like they had no love for this project. And while it was fun to play out a mission on a moving train, it just underscored the broader issue of the maps being simply small. And if these were just bonus missions, like in the previous one, or a few out of many, I would understand. But this isn't the case. Plus, it was coupled with another bizarre decision. They made the resolution 800 by 600, which made it look rather poor on release. Plus, the maps themselves repeated the same thing that the first game did. As in behind enemy lines, the color palette seemed to contain mostly only a variation on white and green, this time they switched that around and made it brown, grey and a washed out green. Which is a bit odd, especially taking into account the phenomenal work and vibrant colors of the previous two installments. Aside from that, this is Commandos 2 but with smaller maps, which gave birth to yet another simplification. The multitude of containers you could rummage through is gone, replaced instead with a few crates dotted across the map. 
It isn't so that this is a must that each and every desk and cupboard should be an interactive object, but it definitely is another example of downsizing. Although they did introduce something new, something that they experimented with previously, and by that I mean more narrative focus. And I must admit, to my surprise, in this case, this was a swing and a miss for me personally. You see, for me, this is the main culprit for the missions being so small that it made me feel boxed in. It inadvertently produced the feeling like there was a right way to complete a mission and no other. I know for a fact that this isn't true because there still are a few different ways to accomplish certain tasks, but I definitely felt more restrained. I think that this is due to less wiggle room in each area. There is no place to spread my wings. Gone was the feeling of unbridled freedom from before. Which is strange because there were still some tactical opportunities for me to take. But maybe because the maps were smaller, these opportunities didn't manifest themselves often enough to make a lasting impression on me. The missions are now segmented into campaigns, Stalingrad, Central Europe and Normandy, and each is made out of a couple of levels. And it should have been immediately apparent what the devs were trying to achieve once I read Normandy on the list, and especially when I played that campaign. But the rest of them have this element too. If you are wondering what I am talking about, it's spectacle, or a cinematic feel to the levels if you like. More spectacle, more grandeur, how could that be bad? Well, as I mentioned before, it many times railroads the player to taking one obvious path to the goal. Sure, it makes for a more epic mission, at least theoretically it does, but that isn't the reason I play a tactical RTS for. I want to sit by the monitor, observe the patrol paths of the enemies and come up with a clever solution to that tactical situation. And maybe one that no other player thought of. This is immensely satisfying, and that is something that suffered greatly by the new, more cinematic approach. Sure, you still have some freedom, but much of it had to be taken away in order to make each mission faster and more visually appealing. The mission objectives are much more streamlined. As now each campaign is seen as one continuous assignment, they boil down to get on the train, kill the sniper or hold back an attack. Every one of those objectives has one thing in common. They tend to be rather fast-paced and feel like someone is rushing you. And more often than not, this is precisely the case. Whether the enemy is attacking or there is a literal clock on the screen rushing you in the most concrete of ways, the devs wanted you to feel urgency. The enemy is hot on your heels. At least, that is what I think the devs had in mind. Because I highly doubted that they wanted to make a lesser version of their previous game. The thing is that the previous game's levels had already grandeur in them. A well thought out locale in a tactical RTS is way more valuable than a big set piece battle like in Stalingrad or Normandy. It's not the explosion that matters, although they are cool, but the way a player gets to the point of that explosion. It is the culmination of sometimes hours of play, of removing obstacles and setting up clever traps to get there. Games such as these don't need a big shootout every few minutes to make a mission memorable, far from it. It's the time spent infiltrating a base or dispatching silently an especially troublesome enemy that makes it so. The explosion should be just icing on top. Heck, in most missions there isn't even one necessary. Like in the one where you capture Colonel Wilhelm van Bello or infiltrate Castle Kolditz. They tried to add more spectacle to a game that paradoxically already had plenty just not the obvious kind. Don't get me wrong, there still is that what made the other Commandos games so good, but it is at times overshadowed by other less important things in this genre. As I mentioned, they even added timed missions, which are the most hated missions of any tactical RTS fan by a wide margin. Sure, they add an element of urgency, but once again, these games do not lend well to that kind of approach. It would seem that most players do prefer it to take such games slow and steady rather than fast and bombastic. Although I'm convinced that there are those players too. The funny thing is that the previous games also accommodated that playstyle, if you wish to do it so. I believe that there is a way to make a campaign of missions that flow one into another. They would just need to do it like in Commandos 2, with big maps but with a removed sense of being rushed forward as this is a demerit for these types of game. At least, I think it is. 
When you think that the mission has to be done fast, you feel like there is no time to plan out an infiltration, set up ambushes or come up with a clever approach to solving problems. Rather than planning, I mostly felt like I was reacting to what the enemy was doing. Patching up holes in my defenses or doing reckless rushes towards a goal because, for example, a sniper was killing my allies. I am maybe alone with that view, but I feel like this type of game needs more room to let the player breathe and think for a while rather than a mad rush. Oh, and they axed the driver. And Natasha. But I always assumed that she was away on some assignment. Getting rid of the driver was actually a long time coming, because even in Commandos 2 he was like a third wheel. Yeah, he still was needed to drive a tank, but other than that his specialization was redundant as now all commandos can drive most vehicles. They tried to give him more utility, like Molotov cocktails, but that didn't work much either, so the logical conclusion was to get rid of him. And I do not begrudge the devs for that, although the spy and the thief have now new hotkeys, and it was a bit hard for me to get used to, but that's a me problem. I know that I did a lot of complaining, but there was just something that bugged me about the third installment that up until writing of the script I couldn't put a finger on. And just by committing it to a written form, it finally dawned on me what it was. And what it was, I explained just now. But that isn't to mean that this game has nothing to offer for the long-standing fans of the series. Especially the Central Europe campaign has a bit of that old magic. Plus, parts of it take place on a moving train, which is a great bonus for me, as I love trains and these kinds of missions. To sum it all up, the third game puts a lot more emphasis on spectacle than the other ones which made me feel a bit stifled in my options when approaching a mission, which were themselves definitely smaller and shorter than before, with even more straightforward objectives. It looked like a Commandos game, it had the recognizable elements of a Commandos game, and even in parts played like a Commandos game, but for me the new additions just missed the mark, it's the one part of the series that I like the least out of the four. It isn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, just not as good as the series made us used to. I just hope that the new installment in the series, Commandos Origins, will have more of the expansion and Commandos 2 in it than the third installment. If yes, then we'll be golden. So, there you have it, all four parts of the Commandos experience. I really do hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, maybe consider sharing, liking, subscribing and engaging. And maybe we'll see us again in the next in-depth look.